Greetings, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Mistake Zone, your weekly dose of our lives and the mistakes within them. My name is Jaron Wade. Joining me, as always, one of my best friends in the whole wide world, Matt Alba. Hey, Matt. Yo. How are you doing? Yo, I'm very allergied. Matt, Mm -hmm. I know we were talking about it just before we started recording this week, and it's the summertime now, and I found myself driving, you know, a lot more, having to go do more errands just for the yard and stuff, and Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, Matt, maybe it's just where I live now, but driving around and seeing all the different pollen and all the dandelion spores and just everything floating around... It freaks me out now, Matt, because I've been sneezing a lot more. I'm not one to, at least I thought I wasn't one to get allergies that much. And just the amount I'm sneezing this year. Normally, I'm a hives guy, Matt. If it gets too hot, I break out in hives. Uh And uh now I seem like to be a sneezy boy. Mm -hmm. And how are you? How are you holding up, Matt, in this weather? My my allergy thing is more so coughing. Right. So I've just been a coffee boy this whole time. Oh man. I honestly thought for a while that I <laughs> I maybe got COVID again. <laughs> so I took a test. I'm negative, Jaron, but it was it was bad enough that I thought maybe maybe I got it again. That's rough, Matt. My condolences, but Matt, let's put a positive spin on this. Mm-hmm. And going back to driving. Uh, you know, I like listening to the radio sometimes when I'm too lazy to hook up my phone into our, you know, the car's dash. Mm-hmm. And there was this one radio topic that they were discussing that apparently, I don't know, don't you hate when you catch a radio segment and you don't know the context or like the study behind the talking point? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But they were discussing how people generally find food tastes better in the summer, in warmer weather. And... Matt, I think I might agree with that sentiment. What about you, Matt? Do you think food tastes better in the summer? Um, I think that there are certain foods that taste better in the summer, like because right. it's 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 like an atmosphere thing, right? Like where you're you're enjoying the environment, so you know it's it's giving that like boost to the food, right? I think just in general, I'm a lot more happy in the summer. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm a miserable boy all year <laughs> round, but in the summer, I'm less miserable. Mm-hmm. Plus, it's that notion that, you know, food is more fresh. I enjoy watermelon. I enjoy mm-hmm. mango a lot more in the summer because that's when I only eat watermelon and mango. I mean, Yeah, it's when we're in season, right? Yeah. So, I think I, I, think I agree. But, Matt, mm-hmm. before we move on from the food talk to talk about our many mistakes in the week, I think we should talk about something that might be sacrilegious to our peoples because okay. Matt, both you and I are Filipino uh-huh. and when I'm grocery shopping this summer season I noticed that I think Filipino food seems to be the quote-unquote it thing for the summer because uh-huh. I know a few years ago I saw a lot more Korean inspired food uh, I think last year it was a lot more Viet inspired food and Matt Mm -hmm. walking around one of the grocery stores I saw the President's Choice brand and then I saw Ube Pondisol hamburger buns calamansi lemonade uh, Filipino adobo (laughs) chips and frozen lumpia and Matt Mm -hmm. as someone who also grew up eating Filipino food. Have you tried any of the President's Choice Filipino brand or Filipino-inspired foods? And what did you think of them? I didn't know that there was an Ube Pandesal burger bun. I think that sounds gross. Um, Not, are you a fan of the Ube? I love Ube. I, mean, but... I like Ube, but in my head, it's a kind of sweeter or dessert-y um, context to me. So okay, in, in that, yeah, with that context, having it with a burger seems incorrect i've had burgers recently with a sweet portuguese bun i do recommend that oh, okay. it's really okay. good okay. i'm not sure uh, i'm not sold on the ube pandi sol just yet yeah but uh matt i tried the ube what was it like the frozen cake or whatever the pie they had it, it was 
it had boba bubbles in it, which oh, that's weird. weirded me out. That weirded me out. And that mm-hmm. apparently you're not you're supposed to let the pies defrost for like ten hours, and I kind of just ate uh, it straight away. <laughs> you just raw dog that pie. <laughs> yeah, I, I raw dog that pie, Matt. Oh. Uh, the calamansi lemonade, it's okay. Oh, okay. It's, I was it's what to find you that. expect. I couldn't, I couldn't find it. Yeah, I wanted to try it. Feel like my dad would be super disappointed if I bought frozen lumpia, so I never <laughs> yeah, even no. thought of that. I just made the, that myself too. I guess we both tried the adobo chips and that. I don't think those taste like adobo. I don't think they taste like adobo. I don't think they taste bad. I just don't think they taste like adobo. Agreed. I think they remind me more of barbecue chips rather than adobo chips. Yeah, and... it's like a heavily peppered barbecue chip with a slight soy sauce flavor, I think. Do you like adobo? Yeah, generally I do. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah do you? It, it's good. I, I do. I think it's one of those things where I had it a lot growing up. So mm-hmm. there was this one period where, man, I kind of don't want to eat adobo anymore. Oh, but yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of as you grow older and the, at least for me, I think I've become to appreciate it a lot more. Mm-hmm. But Matt, I remember there was this, I promise to all our friends out there, we're going <laughs> to actually transition into some actual mistakes. But speaking of mistakes, Matt, I'm not sure if you remember that one period of my life where I didn't eat rice for a while. Uh-huh. And Matt, I think having a lot of Filipino food without rice is the biggest mistake. Yeah. Just because how rich a lot of Filipino food is, mm-hmm. how saucy a lot of Filipino food is without yeah. the rice to kind of cut it. And absorb that sauce. Mm-hmm. <laughs> too much for too much for your <laughs> taste buds, Matt. Uh-huh. Too much. You need but Matt, some kind of carb. You do, Matt. I love carbs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, carbs are so oh, good. Final question: Would you rather give up dairy or would you give up carbs <laughs> if you had to? <laughs> I I would hate to give up both, but I think I would have to give up dairy. Same. Same, same, same. I feel like there's a lot more dairy alternatives that I could put up with rather mm-hmm. than a carb alternative. And uh-huh. I just love me some carbs. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Same. Okay, Matt. Our, our food discussion. I'm sorry I, I let that ride a lot longer than I should have. But, Matt, I love me some food. Same, 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 same. I love some food. And, Matt, you know mm-hmm. what else I love? Hmm? Since we spent last week's episode on a movie, I feel like... I need to kind of just chunk out a portion of the mistake zone to a new movie that came out this week. Mm-hmm. A new Spider-Verse movie. When, oh, it's Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. You watch it in 4DX, right? Not, I wish where I live had 4DX because, Damn. again, to stroke our egos a bit, I listened to last week's episode and your notion that if you're going to go to a movie, it has to be 4DX. Not <laughs> Matt, I kind of agree. I kind of agree. <laughs> oh, man. But, Matt, so Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, the latest Spider-Verse movie, I honestly think that the two Spider-Verse movies to me, especially the first one, Mm -hmm. is probably one of my favorite, if not, I I would go on to say it's at least a top three comic book adaptation, one of the better, or one of the best animated films I've ever seen just from the style Mm -hmm. and even the stories being told. I really did enjoy the first Spider-Verse a lot, and I was uh, really excited for Across the Spider-Verse. But I'm going to not really touch upon story spoilers, but more so this is a kind of in terms of movie layout pacing spoilers ahead. So, Mm -hmm. you know, check the timestamps if you want to skip through it. Um, But before I say there's no mid credit scene, there's no post credit scene. So if you do see the movie, you don't have to stay for that stuff. That's surprising. But if you're not a fan, if a fan of like light, light spoilers, you can just skip ahead to our next segment. Mm -hmm. But Matt, Mm -hmm. going into this movie, I knew that it ends in a cliffhanger. And I can't tell if I would have enjoyed this movie a lot more or a lot less if I knew that, you know, if I didn't know that going in. Just because with this movie, this movie is like two and a half hours as well. Mm -hmm. And Matt, I didn't know the Promise Neverland people made (laughs) across the Spider-Verse. So production on point, visuals great. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of just like we said with the Super Mario Brothers movie where if you have some sort of ties you know if you're familiar with the source material which is spider-man in some capacity 
this is such a love letter to Spider-Man fans that you can grab something. You know, whether you played video games, whether you watched animated features, whether you watched the MCU, the Sony-verse Spider-Man movies, Mm -hmm. in some capacity, there is something for you there, and that's what I appreciate about it. There is a fan service aspect that you didn't really like that you did get in the first spider-verse movie but here it's just full-on in your face and you know me matt i love me some fan service i love me cameo there's a lot of great cameos that i'm kind of excited for you to see the movie as well matt just Mm -hmm. because especially within our friend group there are there are a few cameos that i think we would appreciate more than other people because okay there's specifically one cameo in this movie that I feel like I was the only one that popped in the theater for it. Okay. But so fan service, great visuals on great. It's a, it's a beautiful movie. There are the production, like some of the scenes, how they're laid out is just gorgeous. So that's what I have to say. But again, it's two and a half hours and it ends in a cliffhanger to the point where a lot of people in the theater were notably and vocally upset that it kind of just ends in that way Uh where when you have a two and a half hour movie that ends with a cliffhanger i think it made the pacing issues a lot more evident to me where i feel like across the spider verse put like introduces so many kind of villains and conflicts and twists where it doesn't really it can't go anywhere because i feel like this movie just sets up for the next movie Mm -hmm. and that it's kind of what we were talking about last week again with fast 10 where it's a lot of setup and when you know it's going to be a two-parter a trilogy how invested can you necessarily get when you know there's no payoff and i guess matt as an outsider looking in who will who plans to watch the movie eventually mm-hmm. if knowing it there's a cliffhanger at the end what does that kind of what like how do you approach that mentally at that point i mean i guess knowing that there's a cliffhanger at the end is enough to prep me to know that hey i shouldn't expect a real like a real ass ending to this this movie mm-hmm. it is kind of disappointing to to know that cuz i didn't know that this was going to end in a cliffhanger I didn't even yeah. know that, like, I'm guessing that they have a follow-up movie already planned. Th- thankfully, from what I read, it's supposed to come out next year. I hope it comes out next year. But, again, this was something that I was talking to my partner last night after we saw the movie. And, you know, solidarity to all the writers out there. You know, I want everyone to be compensated fairly. But mm-hmm. it's also hard to get invested in something that comes in parts when there is something like a writer strike going on just because... As a consumer, yes, I want everyone to be compensated fairly. But at the same time, I can't 100% get myself invested in something because I don't know when that payoff will go. So hopefully Beyond the Spider-Verse comes out next year. Um, But again, I think I never was part of a theater so deflated when they saw the ending. And, you know, you had just people going, what the heck? Like, so again... It's one of those things where it's such a long movie and even at one point I checked my phone just to see. We went to a late showing. I was wondering how close towards midnight we were getting and knowing Mm -hmm. that it was two and a half hours and seeing the time, I thought, oh, there's like around 15 more minutes to this movie and there's still introducing and weaving little things here and there. And I think that's where my pacing issues come from just because you know some segments drag on a bit they introduce a lot of different characters here and there they set up conflict and it kind of all builds up towards the last scene which i think i honestly think it's also kind of cheap and it's bait for okay of course there's going to be a next movie of course this is what we're they're doing so other than that, visuals, great. Some of the cinematography is breathtaking. A lot of pretty much all of the voice acting, top notch once again. I think it was just knowing that, okay, this is going to be a cliffhanger. Um, 
the pacing is kind of odd here and there. Oh, this is kind of dragging. Oh, this is actually jam packed a lot in this like tiny segment. Oh, the movie ends. That's kind of the jarring part. But mm-hmm. again, if you're a fan of Spider Man in some capacity, you'll get some. You'll definitely get something out of it. Some of the cameos are really fun. A lot of oh man, that it, it's a fun movie overall. But yeah, just no. I guess no going in. There's a cliffhanger, and that m- might kind of sour you towards the end there but other than that fun movie Mm -hmm. uh still recommend and hope that beyond the spider-verse does come out next year Mm -hmm. okay so jaren while we are still in the um unfortunate neighborhood of iffy stories okay okay (laughs) jaren diablo 4 came out uh yes no okay sorry jaren diablo 4 has early released this uh this weekend and that's why we weren't able to play with you this weekend <laughs> next week though next uh-huh. week and um i am i am one of the <laughs> one of the people who is a problem and bought into this and i have um kind of played through the full campaign of diablo 4 and so matt you're telling me you're level 100 and your name's inscribed in a little statue right now Jaren, that is for hardcore only, <laughs> and I would not have made it. I definitely would not have made that. Um, Matt, when you saw news about that, what was it, the first 100 people to reach level 100 in hardcore gets their name inscribed in a little statue, what was your initial reaction to that? I thought, cool, never gonna, never gonna do that. <laughs> oh man, I've died okay. so many times in this game already, Jaren, and in terms of gameplay, I have been having a very, very good time with this game. Right, but in terms of story, Jaren, this is a video game ass story. Okay, and to stay um spoiler free for this this campaign, because I'm I'm sure like you're gonna play it eventually, and yes, um other other listeners are gonna be playing it eventually. I'm going to. <laughs> it's not it's not out yet, Matt. It's not out. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess that's fair. That's fair. I'm gonna try to um poo poo this as little as possible. <laughs> Jaren, I don't like the way that did the story because i guess much like spider-verse i feel like this didn't end on a cliffhanger but it ended on a and we'll see you in the dlc type of um story right because um overall this is like i said a video game ass video game story hey bad dudes are coming you need to stop them so you have to go like you know do the whole stop the henchman and then stop the the big bad and I was really, really hoping for a kind of story that felt complete. Yes. But this does feel like a first part in the trilogy type oh, story. Okay. And I feel like it's very weird that we've had three of these back to back on the mistake zone, basically. So, but, mm-hmm. Matt, as someone who played a lot of Diablo 3, how would you say the Diablo 4 narrative compares to that? And do you think the kind of shift towards the live service aspect really influenced how they told the story in Diablo 4. I think that Diablo 3 itself had like a pretty okay story. The whole narrative arc of base Diablo 3, I think made sense or was a good ish. Yeah, no, no, it was a good like standalone story. You had your kind of introduction of a new character. I think what's her name? Leah, Leah yeah. or something. And the whole story is basically her narrative arc. And I believe she's the one who eventually turns into Diablo. And it kind of like pushes also the story of the Herodrum. And D4 is also picking up the Herodrum story where you're basically working with a character from, um, D3, um, oh man, I cannot remember this fool's name, even though I've basically spent the past, like, 48 hours with him. Oh, his name is, his name is Lorath. Okay. And I believe, like, I, I really just remember this guy from kind of just talking to Tyrael a bunch in Diablo 3, and I was kind of surprised to see him back in Diablo 4 as one of the main, main characters. And, like I said, Diablo 3 felt like a complete story, and this... Diablo 4 seems like a first part in the trilogy story. I don't want to kind of spoil the story since this is a basically pre-released game, but the ending very much sets up. Okay, Jaren, I think the weird thing about what makes this ending really, really weird for me is that it has a prologue. Oh, um, okay. Which seems weird for a ending of like this game just because... 
like you said, this is sort of a live service game. And it having the prologue of, hey, all these things have happened and now all these NPCs that you've been working with are kind of going to go do their own thing for a bit is weird because, I don't know, you, you don't get to interact with them anymore after the campaign is finished. And I don't know, I think up until that point, everything had already been rubbing me the wrong way because they have a lot of points in this game, Jaren, that are very, I don't know how to say this. It's a very kind of, okay, the heroes have figured out a, a trump card against like whatever baddie they're facing right now. And then they go discuss this, um, or they go get like the trump card, they get it ready, and then they go fight the baddie, and they're like, ha, here is the trump card. But it's long before the trump card is relevant, so they give the baddie adequate time to deal with the trump card mm. sort of storytelling, okay. which I really don't like. And Jaren, I think the thing that, this is just more so a personal thing for me, but I don't agree with the protagonist side right. of the uh, storyline i'm and, and this is what really gets me jared i far more agree <laughs> with um the what, what are they called antagonists kind yeah, of like um, like group. view on the story right but but jared this is also very much a story that's about undertones and themings of temptation and i don't know if i'm just getting conned into joining basically a cult hmm. and i don't know jared i feel like after i finish this um story I thought to myself how easy it would be to like con me into joining a cult now. And I don't know how I feel about this. Now, as someone who listens to a lot of true crime podcasts and media, and a good portion of that deals with cults, Matt, mm-hmm. apparently it is pretty easy to join a cult, which is terrifying to think of. Yeah. But mm-hmm. with... I know I'm planning to get the game sometime next week and hopefully we can do, you know, a deeper dive into the story itself once I, you know, once the game's been out for a few days, I get to sink my teeth into the story a lot more as well. But Mm -hmm. from your perspective, when you see a story laid out this way, you know, a narrative that isn't that satisfying, do you think that might be intentional in a weird way just to get people to kind of come back because for better or for worse when i think of the diablo games i think of people you know rushing through the story in order mm-hmm. to hit that end game content whether that be you know the the riff loop i don't know what that end game content for diablo 4 is uh but like to hit the riff loops or to hit what was it adventure mode or hardcore mode and just do all these things that open up you know, what the game really is. Do you think the, maybe this isn't the right word, but maybe the distorted storyline might be kind of catering to that mindset? Or do you think just, it's just unfortunate writing? I think it's like partially catering to that sort of thing. Honestly, Jeremy, when I got to the end of the story, I almost felt like Blizzard was going like, yeah, you know, like this isn't the end, but like I we know you're going to buy the DLC anyway, so yeah. you're not going to worry about finishing the story right now. Right. Here's the carrot. You you can enter the end game and do what you want to do. But mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. again, I think one of the themes in this episode, especially with the next game we're going to be talking about, is that single player experience, is that narrative where that's why a lot of, maybe not a lot, but a subsect of the community go to these games. And just to hear that, the narrative might not be firing on all cylinders. Doesn't mm-hmm. sound the greatest, but at the same time, that it's really the gameplay loop that people keep coming back to Diablo. And mm-hmm. I know we talked about the open beta um, a few weeks ago, but now that the game is fully released, how's that gameplay, Matt? How's that gameplay loop? And are there things that now that you have your hands on the full game that you know, are really opening up to you that you didn't really get to explore in the beta. Okay, so for the gameplay loop, I am generally enjoying it. There was a a kind of dip that basically happens after the point of the beta, where one of the things I was really praising Diablo about when the beta came out was that I really, really liked the changes that they did to the skill tree, Mm -hmm. where you basically get all your, like, 
skills and build together very early. And for the first kind of 30 levels when you're still unlocking stuff, it's pretty good. But there is a dip that occurs kind of around the kind of 35 to 50 range for me where you've basically gotten your build together. And this can also happen earlier because I guess it depends on like what skills you're actually going to be grabbing. But it kind of I kind of got like a dip in there early because my skills never changed for about 20 levels. So I was kind of respecting a lot, kind of trying to just change things up to prevent it from kind of getting feeling grindy to me. Right. But um because like in those levels you're you're not getting any um game change not game changing, but like kind of skill altering legendaries that I was um that like I guess from my D three experience I was expecting to get to augment my skills. Like you don't really get those again until after fifty when you can unlock nightmare mode and you can get the kind of higher tier of legendary drops so i think that that's really the biggest down point for me in terms of diablo where and that's kind of just like a personal thing for me where i kind of just was finding the unchanging gameplay at that point kind of stale right but after i've gotten past that kind of um hump i'm kind of like getting the legendary the legendary drop rate has kind of started going in my favor i'm kind of more so exploring and pushing more of the dungeons that give me the codex of power legendary powers that i can um use and it's kind of really reopening that kind of staleness of the build for me so i can start putting things where i want them to be okay which is um pretty good plus the the end game i think is varied enough that it's interesting to kind of just like keep grinding around uh, i don't know if you really know what I guess you said earlier you didn't, you don't know what the um, end game for this is. I do not, um, Matt. But again, since this is what people grind for, essentially be on the story, mm-hmm. get to the end game. What is different about Diablo 4's end game, say compared to what we were doing in Diablo 3? And what are you kind of working around with right now? So for the most part, I think like maybe 70 to... 70% of like D3's end game DNA, which was basically bounties and rifts, is present inside of Diablo 4. Like two of the major things that you can do are nightmare rifts or dungeons, which basically are dungeons that get modifier, random modifiers assigned to them. Uh, modifiers like positive ones for you, like hey, when you dash, you drop a pool of poison or like you get um, reduced cooldowns or stuff like that. And then there's like enemy modifiers, which will do things like make them stronger or give them resistances to specific elements or stuff like that. And the nice thing about it is that you see these prior to ever going into the dungeon. So you know what they're going to be. So you can choose to either do it or not do it because you get these as item drops. So you can either like use this item to do this kind of special dungeon or you can destroy this item to get resources to kind of re-roll and get another uh, random, uh, I think they're called sigils, for these uh, dungeons. So that you can like re-randomize them to maybe get a better set of modifiers that like suits you. Okay. Because, like, yeah, like for example, I wouldn't want to fight against a cold immune dungeon or a cold resist dungeon because I primarily put out like cold damage. Like it's that kind of like that sort of thing. So since you're putting out cool damage, are you playing a mage or who are you? Yeah, I'm playing okay. the the character that I pushed to 50 was um, my wizard or sorceress. I can't remember which term they use for the magic caster in this no, game. That's fair. That's fair. But yeah. Not what's your rotation. What's your gameplay loop looking like right now? <laughs> I teleport in. I cast Frost Nova. Frost Nova will freeze everybody, and then I have a passive that for anybody who's frozen, it shoots ice shards at them, and the ice shards, when they hit a frozen enemy, they rebound or like a ricochet to another target, and it kind of just loops like that for a while. Okay. Um, I I cast like protective shields to you know give me back mana, so I don't have to have a generator on my bar, and I have an oops I messed up button, which is deep freeze, so. I, I kind of just, you know, stay in, a, stay in a safe ice bubble for a while when I mess up. It actually sounds and really fun, yeah. Matt. But it's a pretty safe rotation. What 
what made you want to take you know level up the spellcaster as opposed to the other classes and have you been able to dabble with the other classes since you know the pre-release started i think personally i just usually gravitate towards um magey characters whenever i play games i am right now working on a rogue because um i felt like the source or sorceress wizard i'm just gonna call the sorceress was pretty good for aoe kind of burst and now i want to raise a rogue as a single target dps kind of like boss killer okay because i felt like when i was playing the sorceress i was not being very helpful against the bosses because um one of the things that the bosses have is a kind of cc bar where when you cast cc on them it raises this bar and until this bar is full it does not they do not get cc'd once the bar is full they will get stunned and then they will have every single type of cc i guess tag or modifier or whatever applied to them so that anything that like you know uses those um will be able to proc and since my build procs off the freeze uh like crowd control i am actually very bad against bosses for that reason okay so i wanted to raise basically a character that is the exact opposite of that now oh, that makes sense mm-hmm. and kind of like going back into um end game stuff the reason that i really really wanted to do th- this uh, rogue character is because i went into a world boss which is one of the other um things that you can kind of do as an end game um thing and Jaren, did you do the Ashava stuff when you were playing the beta? Can you refresh my memory what that was? It was the uh, kind of big world boss on the east side of the um, map. Yeah, I was able to do the world boss, I think, twice, and, or three times, three times, I believe. Okay. And I was only part of a round that was able to kill it once. Okay. Jaren, I went to go do a world. I went to go do a Shava because uh, I saw that the uh, timer was going and a different <laughs> boss came out and I was very surprised. Really? I didn't know that um, a different boss could show up there. I thought that. Oh, that's actually really cool. Yeah. Once you go here, I thought, oh, this is a Shava spawn point. And when it wasn't a Shava, I was like, oh, I don't know where to stand. And <laughs> I died. <laughs> But um, classic map, classic Diablo yeah. or classic world boss experience. I think uh-huh. that's one of my favorite things that, that I'm looking forward to is just partaking in a good world boss attempt. Mm-hmm. I, I think some of my fondest memories when I used to play Guild Wars was joining in in world bosses. So mm-hmm. yeah, looking forward to it. Mm-hmm. And um, kind of just going back to the end game loop. The other part of like Diablo 3's endgame that kind of carried over to Diablo 4 is the... It's kind of like the bounty system, but in this one, right. it's called uh, Whispering Tree, Tree of Whispers, something like that. And basically, it kind of just takes those... If you remember in the beta, there was kind of those like orange circle type of events where you kind of just like kind of group up uh, and they're kind of like mini world events where things are going to spawn in, kind of like do their own thing and whatnot. And... What the Tree of Whispers does is it basically marks five different areas because there's five areas on the map and, or five like major areas on the map. And it kind of picks one area within each of those and it makes it kind of the focal point for the next hour, which um, I actually think is very nice. Because when I was playing through the campaign, I didn't really see people. Like It was very rare for me to see people kind of group up with them uh, naturally and push this like kind of content together and then kind of just never see them again but the fact that a tree of whispers kind of condenses every buddy into like one of these five zones for a bit i think is very nice like those zones are usually very populated you're kind of all doing a kind of um train of people which jaren i don't know if you remember from guild wars I'm, i'm sure you do but one of the things i really liked in that kind of like mmo experience was finding somebody doing an event and then slowly and slowly people accumulate and then like once you kind of start accumulating more and more people you kind of just get that whole kind of loot circle going yes and you're all a loot train if you will mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you're all just like running together and the nice thing about um this kind of like processes is that um as long as you're doing these events you kind of get the 
points towards it. And once you get these points, you just go back to the Tree of Whispers and you turn these points in for a cache of items. And these items are kind of like randomly assigned to you, but you're kind of given a category of something like helmets or uh, two-handed weapons, one-handed weapons, boots, like that sort of thing. And then you kind of pick which category of item you want, and that's going to be what's in the cache. And usually it's a nice amount of stuff, too. It's like crafting mats, those items. Usually, I feel like you'll get at least one legendary, regardless of like whether it's a good legendary or not. And you'll get kind of sigils that push you back into the nightmare dungeon sort of thing. Okay, Matt, mm-hmm. that sounds actually really fun. And I'm looking forward to that because I love me a good loot train. Mm-hmm. And kind of, you know, going back to what you were saying, I'm someone who I enjoyed my time when, you know, when we all played WoW, when we all played, I think there were some other instances where we would play MMOs together. And mm-hmm. I think just see, being able to, you know, freely do your own thing, run into a person and not necessarily, you know, party up and say, oh, let's all get ready to do, you know, a raid or something like that. But mm-hmm. just having world events to kind of populate your surroundings is, you know, part of the appeal to me. And going back to what you were saying about the story mode, just kind of beelining through that just so I can kind of get to that. Something a lot more casual where, hey, maybe I want to join this train for a bit and then Mm -hmm. just jump out. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to that aspect as well. And, you know, to hear that, you know, you're still working towards something, you're still getting something. And Mm -hmm. that's a good gameplay loop. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Jared, I'm I'm really, really waiting for... um like all our friend group to get into this game because yeah. one of the other end game loops Jaren is the is the PVP zone mm. and Jaren this this kind of PVP zone works in the exact same way as um oh shoot what was the name of that Ubisoft kind of what the Ubisoft game that had the dark That's zone the dark zone yes uh, uh the division the, yes the yeah yeah it works division. a lot like the okay. division where it's in essence a normal zone but the enemies Matt, here hmm? is Diablo an extraction game now, <laughs> Jared. There's there's an extraction kind of thing that goes on in this. Area. Oh man, Matt, I'm bad at video games. I'm terrified, <laughs> but that sounds right up my alley. Jared, Jared strength in numbers, strength in numbers. <laughs> okay, uh, but basically, yeah, it's it's kind of like similar. You go into this area. The enemies are slightly more powerful than outside of this area, and they drop a kind of irradiated. Or in this case, I guess, corrupted. Of course. Of course it would be corrupted. Yeah. Corrupted currency. And then you have to go to a shrine in the area and toggle it on. And then you have to wait, I think, like one to three minutes, somewhere in there. And if you can stay alive and stay in, in this like <laughs> extraction bubble or this cleansing bubble, your your materials um, stay or like get um, cleansed and then they stay yours. Okay. And Jaren, I need, <laughs> I need protection. <laughs> oh man, man, I'm, uh, I'm crazy excited to, uh, you know, find uh, what is it, two other pals, and just roll through that. That mm-hmm. sounds so entertaining to me, Matt. Uh, uh-huh. I love me a good butt clenching extraction <laughs> experience. Don't care how wrong that sounds. I'm really looking forward to that. But mm-hmm. so in these extraction, I guess. You said these are PvP areas, right? Yes. Can PvP happen anywhere? Or is it one of those, hey, someone put up an extraction bubble. If we enter this bubble, this is where the PvP happens. Or can it just happen anywhere? Sort of anywhere. Okay. So how it works is that um, in this area, you can do an action called, I think it's like marking for blood. Uh, When you mark for blood, you are able to attack other players and other players are able to attack you okay but you can be in this area without marking for blood and really it's kind of just keeping your eye open for for people sneaking up on you and then uh, marking for blood i can't really remember exactly if you can mark for blood outside of the pvp zones town or if you have to do it within the town i think you can kind of just like mark for blood anywhere within the pvp area okay but uh, th- that Jaren, that's why that's why I need a group. Okay, Jaren, I've been considering joining just a random clan. 
um, for for Diablo, just you know, to to protect myself. Hey Matt, you gotta do what you gotta do, but okay, that's something I'm definitely going to start working towards when I finally get my hands on this game. Jared, should I should I join a clan that's about like old people, or should I join a clan that's about VTubers? Oh man, can you join multiple clans, or is it just you can only join one clan? You can only join oh, one man, clan. Oh man, that oh man. I know a lot of the VTubers we're following are starting to play, so. I know there's probably not we're not gonna be able to join their clan, but hey, they uh-huh. might have a fan base clan that you might be able to. Mm-hmm. Who mm-hmm. whoever is the most chill is probably where I'm going at, Matt. But Matt, speaking mm-hmm. about clans and kind of just groups, are we are we at the age where we're gravitating towards, hey, let's just join like the old man group where it's just a bunch of dads and moms who uh-huh. are trying to find time to play and just hanging out oh, man. with our quote unquote Je- new people. Jim, you know, when I was in my like er- mid early twenties, I joined a Archage um, guild called Too Old for Games. Yes, and I think Jared, that was one of the most enjoyable clans I ever been a part of because no one was. I guess, like, really hardcore about playing right. the game. It very much was a um, kind of casual clan of, like, and even me being, I guess, like, 20, like, 23, 25 at that point. I can't remember when I played. But at that point, like, I was on the young end of that clan. And I don't know, it's a pretty nice experience. So and I'm kind of hoping I can find something like that for uh, Diablo 4. Okay. Because the client finder is actually, like, pretty nice. You just put in, like um, like, a keyword. You put in kind of languages you put in kind of tags that are like one some of the preset tags that they have and then you kind of just search and it shows you like hey these clans like their name their the amount of people in this clan and i think it's a pretty clean system i do wish you could join more than one clan i feel like that would be like kind of nice as a social aspect sort of thing but yeah just toggle who you're which clan you're kind of active in yeah i think that would be nice Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i know there's logistics to that but yeah that Mm-hmm. I think when the time comes, if we're not starting our mistake zone clan, it's easily searching keywords, old, antisocial, uh-huh. hides chat, just wants uh-huh. to be around other people, looking uh-huh. for protection, uh-huh. casual. I need that. I, I specifically look, look for casual in the uh, yep. description or keyword, I mean. But yeah, Matt, you it, you really sold me with that description mm-hmm. because I, I kind of... I. In theory, I like the idea of an extraction game, but I haven't really been able to put that, you know, into practice recently. So that's definitely something I'm, you know, looking forward to. But mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. again, Diablo being a beefy game, we're definitely going to do some weekly check-ins on that. But yep. there is one thing I wanted to kind of ask you about. And, you know, you dropped the word legendary, you dropped the word build. And I guess when we play loot games... You know, this is something we discussed previously where you kind of get to that point where even though we're surrounded by drops everywhere, we're really only looking for certain rarity colors. You know, we're looking for the yellows, Mm -hmm. we're looking for the oranges. You know, when you're kind of climbing up the ladder, anything goes, it's whatever gives you the high green DPS. But, you know, towards the end, you, of course, have to, you know, target what are my max level legendaries what are my higher end ones and from a player perspective you're playing perspective matt mm-hmm. what do you do with the legendaries that what do you do with the legendaries you find on, while you're climbing that level ladder what happens to all your old ones do you save them do you sell them discard them like just in general what's your mentality when it comes to lower to mid-level legendaries I mean, in Diablo, I guess it's a little bit different now Mm -hmm. because of the extraction system. Because in Diablo now, the legendary items aren't really items on their own. They're basically just items that have a legendary affix on them. And you can extract the affix and then put it onto a different item. Okay. So the legendary items that you get as you're leveling are worth keeping because you can take the legendary, like affix out and then put it for example onto a yellow max level item right which i think is like a very nice way to do it and i don't know jen the the fact that i now have to not just look for legendaries but i have to kind of pick up yellows and and read them and parse them to see if they're good to drop a legendary onto is 
<laughs> is sort of overwhelming to me now because now there's so much like I had to think about the balance but I kind of like the system versus something like I guess early Diablo 3 or most other ARPGs that I can think of where if you get a legendary as you're leveling it up it's basically useless once like 10 levels later mm-hmm. which I think is like unfortunate but I think the way Diablo 4 is doing it is a nice nice way to do it okay I think that's what is also kind of worrying me as well, just because, again, I guess I'm co- approaching it as a kind of casual coming in, just looking for a good time with the pals mm-hmm. and kind of getting into the nitty gritty of, okay, what do I build towards? How do I optimize? You know, w- mm-hmm. when do I bust out the, sp- you know, the second screen spreadsheet? Uh, I think uh-huh. that's what I'm kind of not looking forward to but at the same time kind of am looking forward to just because that is kind of the point when you're trying to build a character in these types of games Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. but yeah matt definitely going to be checking in uh in the next few weeks as well hopefully we can do a story deep dive but what are Mm -hmm. your final thoughts on your pre-release time with diablo 4 i really like it i am really liking this um end game loop i like that when you start a second character after finishing the campaign that you don't have to do the campaign again right okay oh matt that Mm -hmm. that really speaks to me because i do not (laughs) like replaying campaigns and i just want to get to the juicy stuff when i make a new Mm -hmm. character Mm -hmm. but yeah matt diablo 4 is sounding good you know, story might not be the greatest, but at least that end game gameplay loop is there. And Matt, it's just mm-hmm, more clicking, mm-hmm. which I'm looking forward to. Yep, yep. So Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about buying into things maybe we shouldn't have bought into uh-huh. or didn't have to buy into, mm-hmm. Matt, mm-hmm. another game came out this week where I don't know what it is, Matt. I've gone on the record numerous times on the Mistake Zone on Saturday Morning Arcade that me, Jaron Wade, am a... I don't understand fighting games. I'm bad Uh at fighting games. I am... I am the living embodiment of the famous Mike Tyson phrase, everyone has a plan until they get punched (laughs) in the face. Uh And Matt... Mm -hmm. I can grind in the lab. I can read all the tutorials. I can watch all the beginner's guides that I want. But the moment I step into that, you know, 2D fighting space, Mm -hmm. the moment I get hit, everything falls out the window Uh or falls out of my head Uh and I'm in a tizzle. Uh And yet, and yet, Matt, Mm -hmm. a new Street Fighter game comes out. And for some reason, I buy it day one. And I come to you with a few hours under my belt of Street Fighter VI. Mm -hmm. And it's... I don't know why I bought the Fancy Schmancy edition when I probably could have sufficed with the regular edition. What's in the uh, Fancy Schmancy edition? That is essentially, you know, your first season character pass. And, you know, just a few of the um, quote-unquote premium currency... Uh, it's kind of in that regard to Matt, but mm-hmm. Street Fighter VI is the latest installment in you know this beloved franchise, and I have to start off. Matt, this game looks gorgeous. As mm-hmm. I said with Spider Verse, there's just something about how Street Fighter VI looks that I'm a big fan of, just because you know we're coming from four and five that had you know this. I don't want to say, you know, cartoony look to it because, you know, it's not cell shaded, but, Mm -hmm. you know, it had that both Street Fighter 4 and Street Fighter 5 have a distinct look where they do look different, but they they do have some similarities to them. And just looking at Street Fighter 6, and I'm not saying it's a lot more realistic, but compared to 4 and 5, I think there's... You know, for lack of a better word, a more maturity to it, like a more refined look compared to what I'm used to normally from Street Fighter, mm-hmm. where I just think it looks gorgeous. And Matt, it, it's Street Fighter. It's the Street Fighter you know and love. 
but at the same time, they've made a lot of modern concessions to try to really open this up to a lot more players. And as we can see, just recently on launch, it broke, I think, the most the concurrent record for a traditional fighting game with, I believe it was like 64K concurrent players at once. And so uh-huh. it's kind of working in some degree because there's a lot more options at your disposal. The most important one to me being the modern controls where you have technically three different controls and only two of them are viable online, which is, you know, you have your classic mode, that's your standard six buttons, you know, light, medium, heavy punches, light, medium, heavy kicks. And then you can use a combination of those to activate special mechanics to the game, which are Mm -hmm. drive impacts and then drive parries, Mm -hmm. which... You know, in some degree, this is reminiscent to Street Fighter 4. Even though I played Street Fighter 5, I played a lot more Street Fighter 4. So essentially, a drive parry is um, kind of like your parry where you're able to hit it. It will use one of your drive impact meter, and you can essentially parry a move. If you do it right when the attack hits, that's a perfect parry. And then you have your drive impact, which is similar to a focus attack to me um, from Street Fighter 4, where it is a attack with, I believe, you know, some invincibility frames, and then you can do uh, attack at the cost of some drive impact meter as well. Mm-hmm. Then again, this is all from a casual perspective. I bet if Mark, our <laughs> Saturday morning RK friend, was here, he would have taught, told me how I was wrong. But, that, you know, that's the basic uh-huh, gist. Uh-huh. And then you have modern controls, which kind of takes it to a light attack, a medium attack, a heavy attack button, you know, a special move button, and then something called an assist button, where, say, I was holding the assist button down, I can hit, you know, I can mash out the light attacks just to do an auto combo. I can mash out the medium attacks to do a auto combo. Same thing with hard. Mm -hmm. And... If I were to do a special move plus the assist, that gives me the EX version at the cost of some meter as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, special moves are done in modern mode with, you know, it's the smash controls essentially, Matt, yeah. where if I hit it neutral, I'll do my Hadouken. If I do right and the side special, that gives me my dragon punch mm-hmm. or then my spinning kick if I do it the other direction. So essentially it's one of those, okay, it's more condensed in a way, but at the same time, you're missing out on a lot more options than you compare to the classic mode. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it, it it's a way to kind of bridge in everyone together and um, at least appeal to a lot more players that might not be able to wrap their head around, you know, the, six, the traditional six button, you know, controls with your punches and kicks. Mm-hmm. There's also a, I believe, a single player third control option which is essentially hey just mash it out something will happen nice uh that that's your super casual i have no intention to go online control scheme but uh while we're on the topic of controls matt Mm -hmm. i i feel like again this is what i was talking um to you and rakush about when we were talking about idol showdown where it's that weird pride thing to me where, okay, I want to play Street Fighter the proper way. I want to use my classic controls. But mm-hmm. at the same time, oh, but I don't really plan to take this seriously. I don't plan to go pro. I don't even think I'm going to try to go online that much. I'll probably do my typical, let's hit silver and just retire from this game. Uh-huh. And I think modern controls would be fine in that regard. But it's there's something that throws me off about kind of both controls where I feel like, to me at least, classic is more suited for your typical fight stick. Yes. Just because, you know, every I feel like Street Fighter really opened up to me when I had a fight stick with me just because it's all laid out there. Mm-hmm. You know, your face buttons, all your six attacks are right there just because when you're on a control pad, the fact that like your heavy attacks were on, like your shoulder buttons always threw me off. Yes. And I think just in general, it's easier for me to do dragon, the dragon punch motion on a fight stick. So Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think classic control, uh, classic mode to me, like I'm never, I've never been a pad player, but it just makes more sense to me on a fight pad. But then 
when we go into the modern controls, it's the fact that you're holding down the assist button to activate, you know, your X moves mm-hmm. or like your auto combos. That feels awkward on, you know, a fight stick where I found myself trying to rebind my like command or my buttons where, okay, where should I hold, where should I assign you know, the assist button where it feels natural to hold something down, to hold one button down while I, you know, where I can more comfortably hit my my special button, where I can more comfortably hit my attack button. So I feel like modern controls are well adapted for mm-hmm. a controller just because you can easily hit hold down your assist uh, trigger, kind of like your character action games when, you know, you're yeah, doing yeah. combos in that regard. So I think... For me, it's that weird dilemma of I'm used to the fight stick now, but it doesn't necessarily adapt to the modern controls that well. But with the modern controls, that kind of opens up a few more options at for someone from a casual perspective. Mm-hmm. And again, that's something that I'm trying to deal with just to see what feels more comfortable to me. And Unfortunately, I don't have that answer right now. Um, you know, just talking about the game to you, but you know, both have their pros and cons. Again, you know, you have the options given to you in classic mode, but at the same time, I feel like, hey, when you have a special move dedicated to left and special attack rather than you know dragon uh, punch motion plus an attack button, I feel like you know you can instantly answer some things in modern mode that you might not necessarily be able to do in classic mode oh. despite having a lot more options available actually so after our episode on idle showdown yeah i actually was looking more into the kind of classic and modern controls of street fighter because i didn't really yeah know about them that well and a lot of the stuff that i was seeing kind of lines up with what you were saying where classic really was made for a fight pad or fight stick kind yeah. of control scheme and kind of like you were saying i i very much agree when i was playing on a standard controller like a fighting game where it did have the kind of three punch three kick system i i basically <laughs> i basically hated doing it because yep. i didn't kind of like hitting the shoulders or triggers for the heavies or whatever ended up on there yeah and that like modern controls does seem like it's made with the i guess modern controller in mind yeah but one of the surprising things i saw was that apparently the modern inputs or like when you're doing your specials and stuff has a delay to it to simulate the um like the time it takes to put in a like actual dragon punch motion and whatnot I don't know if, like, I guess, like, it's not noticeable or not for you. Maybe as someone super... That's something I want to, like, talk to Mark about just to see if that's kind of noticeable to him. Just because maybe the concept of me just hitting, you know, left and special makes it seem faster to me. And I'm not actually considering, oh, there might be a delay here. So that, mm. that's something I'll definitely look into as well. Again... Actually, for left and yeah. right special, is that, um... Is it, like, Smash where it's basically just side special or does left and right have like a different can have a different input in um modern control no uh, no there are two different ones so left and right oh, are okay. two different downs one as well and then you have neutral up um up special doesn't do anything from what i saw uh huh. which you would think coming from a smash background yeah. you would think that would be your like your uppercut equivalent but mm-hmm. um yeah the side specials are two different ones there but yeah, Matt, it's one of those things where, again, I tried to play modern, but I, again, it's the, it's my brain coming to me where I can't necessarily um, wrap my head around certain things just because similar to, say, a, with classic controls, like I like to do the, the combo trials just to see oh, what are, you know, just the bread and butter things that I can, like, lean into? What are, like, the simple mm-hmm. three hit combos that I can kind of do? Uh, since my play style in fighting games is really more defensive and trying to do, not necessarily a zoner character, but kind of just picking my the right distance, playing more defensively, and trying to capitalize with a bread and butter when something might go wrong for my opponent's end. But... 
Mm -hmm. When I get to the more advanced um, modern combos, like say something tells me, okay, it's heavy kick or heavy attack, heavy attack, assist, heavy attack, special, and then assist special with like a direction thrown in there. My brain Mm -hmm. just like shuts down. Like the concept of heavy attack, heavy attack, assist heavy attack neutral special like i just shut down that like i don't know if it's something just to do with like processing but that was the equivalent of you know light light down light medium down medium where (laughs) when i see something like that i just go okay i want to go back to smash so i can (laughs) i can mash out a and then throw out a special somewhere but Mm -hmm. that that's just me again i kind of relay that to not really growing up with fighting games um, not being able to get that foundation down and you know not understanding the fighting game language and realistically speaking not wanting to kind of put in the time to understand that and you know i know Mm -hmm. that's really on me for not wanting to put in the time to enjoy it at that level but at the same time it just feels good to you know press buttons and seeing people all get hit like I like uh-huh. me good combat, and Street Fighter Six looks like good combat. Um, just even going in there against some CPU matches, just to you know get the buttons down and learning at my own pace what links into what is just an enjoyable experience in itself. Like, uh, just a random aside, I'm not sure if you ever played uh, fighting games with uh, Julian's brother, and it w- it always amazed me how he could. You know, we'd be playing. He'd say, oh, give me two seconds. He'd go to the computer, look up a combo, come back, and just instantly be able to, like, pull it off. And something like that, I could never imagine doing. So, Mm -hmm. again, that's my thing with fighting games. But luckily, there is a single-player component to Street Fighter VI, which is the World Tour mode. And this has been described as something Yakuza light. And while it might not have the depth of something you would expect from Yakuza and from, you know, the early reviews, I saw, oh, this is a kind of a pretty lackluster and boring mode. Matt, I actually find myself enjoying World Tour mode a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm not that far into it. But before I go into it proper, World Tour mode does not run well on the Steam Deck, Matt. <laughs> yeah. I thought this yeah. would be the perfect Steam Deck mode for me, especially with modern controls. But mm-hmm. it's locked to 30 on the Steam Deck. and But for some reason, it just feels like molasses when it plays. Like uh-huh. I, t- I put everything to low, but for some reason, it just feels so sluggish, especially going from like your PC where it just looks great. But... World Tour mode in itself is the single player component. First up, Matt, got to create your Mm -hmm. avatar. And Uh it's actually a pretty robust avatar creation tool where uh, there there is a, I believe it's SF6 avatars. And I'm waiting to let that cook. Like, I'm not really that. I think I made it to chapter two in World Tour mode. And I think I'm Mm -hmm. okay with, you know, resetting once some good character formulas come out where you can use the drive ticket currency uh you can get these tickets from you know your weeklies and your dailies as well but i believe it costs 50 um tickets to kind of respect your character um appearance wise so you can do that but Mm -hmm. again matt i want to save my currency for say clothing items in the shop so uh Again, you start off with doing your character creation. Uh, a lot of funny stuff out there already. I saw a 2D from the Gorillas. I saw a good Ganondorf. Someone made Taylor Swift. You know, <laughs> community cre- creations are going to community create, Matt. You know, mm-hmm. and then you create your avatar. And Matt, there are some monstrosities out there as well. But world tour mode is split into the open world segment where you have these big open city areas and you're kind of walking around, going to talk to characters to progress the story, finding items in the world chests that, you know, give you stuff as well. And, you know, I think one of the things that we saw in trailers for um, this game is when you're 
progressing in world tour mode you'll un unlock a lot more special moves to kind of give your character so essentially you start off mm -hmm. with luke as your master you have a bit of you know your move sets are standard hey here's your punches here's your kicks and here's a few special mm -hmm. moves you learn from luke but as you progress through story mode you'll get to meet all the different street fighters, all the different world warriors who you can take on as masters. And then from there, you're able to kind of edit your move set of, okay, I might start off with Luke's moves, but maybe when Chun Li mm -hmm. uh, teaches me, she'll give me her spinning bird kick. And then I'll be not only use that in fights, but I'll be mm -hmm. able to traverse in the world using a spinning bird kick. And that <laughs> might let me uh -huh. travel somewhere that I might not have been able to uh -huh. reach beforehand and that's kind of where the zaniness is coming into play there and i don't know matt it's, it's just your standard yakuza in the sense that you're traversing this open world and my favorite part matt is you can go up to like just you know the npcs in the game are essentially characters made in the avatar creator or just randomly generated you hit X, you uh -huh. challenge them to a fight, they give you the, they put their fists up, and Matt, you just transition into a 2D fight. And <laughs> not gonna lie, I spent the a good hour just grinding that first area, going up to random people and challenging them to fights. Matt, I don't have a robust move set. <laughs> I just have my basic punches, my basic kicks, and like two special moves. And yet, there's something satisfying about just going up to a random person saying, hey, let's throw down. And then... <laughs> Treating it like a Yakuza brawler where I have this deep mechanically fighting game that has yet to open up to me because I refuse to learn anything. But I want to mash, oh punch, God. punch, and then do my special move. And again, I could have got the same experience by buying the regular edition, but not, I'm bad with money. <laughs> and I'm literally treating this like a Yakuza game where I'm just going around doing my basic brawling. And for some reason, I'm finding joy in that. And oh, it, it's your typical story, Matt. You have your um, rival character that you start off as trainees under Luke. And he's like, no, nope, I got to go my own way. I need to find my own strength. And I'm probably going to run into him down the road. You're meeting all the different world warriors. They're like, I see where people say this is almost like a no story because like from what I've played so far, it is just your typical anime. Hey, I want to get stronger. I want to learn from the best. And there doesn't seem to be any conflict there. And yet I'm perfectly content with just running up to people and challenging them to fights. And man doing and then standing around people and then posing with my character to take screenshots because matt mm -hmm. the second menu item is the battle hub and this is you know something that we're kind of used to from the arc fighting system or the arc systems games where it's this big lobby with a bunch of different arcade machines you can sit at an arcade machine and wait for people to come up to you and challenge you or you can just put on your uh status say hey let's let's get a fight going this is their online hub and matt you know me mm -hmm. it's going around going to people's funny avatars posing beside them and taking screenshots that's nice. my street fighter battle hub experience you can also take your kind of avatar with their custom move set and then go into the avatar fighting place where you can just queue up avatar fights which doesn't mm. really seem balanced because I could go in there as my level two character with my no move set and fight someone who is level 20, level 40, level 60. So enter at your own risk there, Matt. But yeah. Does, sorry. Yeah. Does the level affect kind of damage output or is that really just towards, um, uh, what do you call it? Just like, I guess, move list availability. Well, level. So of course, there's like a skull tree as well where it, it says that you can. Skull tree in a sense that, oh, do I, do I want my punches to do more damage? Do I want more drive impact meter bars? Do I want more oh, vitality? So Where um, it's one of those things that the game says that you can unlock all the trees eventually and then you can pick what you have active. But at the most part, you're kind of picking your style there. So um, it's not necessarily... I guess it is. it really does um, play into what 
of the character trees can I unlock and then equip to my character. So uh, it, it's kind of like the Wild West out there. I don't think there's like proper matchmaking for avatar fights. But again, it's one of those things where they tell you straight up, hey, you can create some really funky characters. You can give them long legs and long arms. And that would actually uh-huh. affect your reach. Like you can by oh, default well. have like stretchy dulcet arms. But at the same time, you're, even though you have long reach, if you whiff something, you're way more open to damage or not being oh, able to sense. hit your character. So that's a weird funky element that, you know, balance is thrown oh, out the weird. window. But Matt, it, it's yeah. fun. It's it's a fun avatar <laughs> creator. And I can't wait to see what people are cooking up that I can steal and download and get their avatar download codes. I can't wait for the Street Fighter meta body build. <laughs> yep. You definitely know that's going to happen at some point. But yeah, Matt, again, from a casual pers- my casual perspective, it it looks gorgeous. The fighting, from what I can comprehend, feels good. The depth is honestly there. But yeah, the world tour mode might be lacking in any narrative, you know, a strong narrative. But if you just want to go around challenging NPCs <laughs> to fights, so that's your mode. Like, again, I might... It's hard to recommend to buy at full prices, even like the fancy schmancy edition for all of like the characters, if you're really going from a casual perspective. But if you just like Street Fighter, if you're a fan of the franchise, there's definitely something for you there. And there's a lot more casual options to kind of give you something similar to like, say, the Mortal Kombat games, similar to the Injustice games where they're might not be a narrative on their levels that the Never Realm uh, devs do, but there's something, there's a charm to Street Fighter VI that I didn't have in um, mm-hmm. Street Fighter IV, Street Fighter V, that makes me, from my casual, I can't comprehend combos perspective, I'm able to find enjoyment in. And I think that that's my time with Street Fighter VI. I'll probably play here and there in between, you know, Diablo. Uh, and hopefully we can get Mark in on a future episode just to get an actual take on Street Fighter VI. But hey, mm-hmm. if you want my Yukazuza Light updates, Matt, I'll, I'll be sure to share them in the upcoming weeks. Mm-hmm. So Matt, mm-hmm. speaking about check-ins, I think it's that time this week, Matt. Mm-hmm. We're still at it. Tears, The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom... That Mm -hmm. this is such a big beefy boy game where I was looking at our play times because Matt, I'm a pervert (laughs) like that. I hate to break it to you, Matt, but I'll check your play time here and there just to see how we like (laughs) compare to each other. Okay. Because Matt, you have some hours on me. What am I at? Last time I checked, you were, I think, 105. This was a few days ago. And you were at 105 and I was at 55. Okay. (laughs) Recently, I checked. I'm around 60, and I saw that I've only done 60 shrines, Matt. That's I do. I average one shrine per hour, which I think I think that's fine. Uh-huh. Think that's yeah, fine. yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. But Matt, status check. I still have only completed the Rito dungeon. I started the Zora quest line. I flew up to the the water temple. I went to the Water Temple boss area and nothing happens because I, I haven't properly started the dungeon. I heard that that actually uh, kind of breaks the game a little. That you can just go to the dungeons or? No, I heard um that if you head to the dungeon before you meet the, I guess, or not me, but like kind of get the relevant NPC. Right. You can't just like teleport back to it and bring the NPC. You have to do the actual traversal stuff or else the game kind of gets wonky yeah. or into a wonky state. No, that makes sense. Kind of. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Matt, I feel honestly one of the things that I like about, you know, the dungeons or the temples is, and then, mm-hmm. okay, let me rephrase that. One of the things that I like about the sky area in general is that it, the concept of having the dungeons kind of just out in the open as opposed to you entering mm-hmm. a door and then that teleporting you to another, you know, fragment of the map, so to say. Yeah. Like And likewise, some of the shrines in the sky, instead of you going inside a shrine 
everything kind of happens outside in the overworld. I think that's a really refreshing take to me that makes the world feel more alive as opposed to, say, me exiting said world to enter another world, if that makes sense. And Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any thoughts regarding how the temples are implemented into the open world and how some of the shrines in the sky specifically are more incorporated in the world as well. Yeah, I kind of like the the sky shrine Mm. concepts where they're basically, hey, here's the shrine. We're going to point like a green green like ray tracing line yeah. from here to where the uh, thing is go find it and bring it back like i like that concept i always actually get surprised when i see that concept on the um the the surface yeah. as well like it's always like a nice um change of pace yeah matt speaking about my hour count again i'm 60 hours in i've only done one temple and i feel like I haven't, you know, explored the Goron area. I haven't explored the Gerudo area. While I have all of the Sky Towers unlocked, I feel like there are Mm -hmm. subsections of the map that I have nothing in there. Like, Matt, I haven't properly explored K Village. I haven't explored that one region that has the famous designer that I keep hearing about. I just recently (laughs) discovered Terrytown or whatever it's called, but yet I haven't done anything there. And yet I'm 60 hours deep into the game, Matt, where I've I've completed full gaming experiences in less time. (laughs) And yet I feel like I haven't scratched the surface of Breath of the Wild. And yet I couldn't tell you what I've actually done meaningfully other than exploit the heck out of this game. (laughs) Jaren, I really think you need to push the uh, the fashion town, okay. which is um, Hateno. Yes, uh, which was in the first game, so I don't really feel bad about like saying that because um, no, they tell you straight up gives... <laughs> like where, oh yeah, what the town is. Now, where is it on the map? So I can just go in that direction. It's in kind of like the southeast okay. portion of the map. I think that that's probably based on where you are. Probably the best thing to do is that because, near Lurin? Uh I think so. I think it's a bit more north. Okay. West of that. Because I just but... recently finished the lore. Like, I saved that town from the pirates, and then I helped Bozy or whatever uh, rebuild the town. And now I have to mm-hmm. find someone to so they can do, like, water raising or something. Uh-huh. Yeah, like, I think I think that is a very important, like, place to push. Just because that's where you get the, um, for, you get the kind of... Set shrine sensor upgrade. Oh, okay. Like you did the stuff with Robby in the starting village, right? I no. <laughs> or like the underground picture stuff. He like gave me a camera. Like build? Yeah, he gave me a camera, but I was again at that point where Josh Joshua told me, "Hey, you should yes. probably do a temple before I tell you to do something else." And then I had to go. Do you not have auto build? I have auto build, but I found that on my own. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah you should. I think you should push that because I think, um, I guess, gameplay mechanics, yeah. spoilers here. But once you push that um, Joshua quest, Robbie moves to Hateno. Okay. And then in Hateno, you get uh, upgrades for the Purapad, which one gives you uh, the Shrine Sensor, yes. which I, which is, like I think, a basic upgrade. It also allows you to get the Advanced Purapad upgrades, which I all think oh, are kind of worth okay. it. Okay. Um, which are the hero mode, which I think was a DLC in Breath of the Wild, where it kind of shows everywhere that you've walked on the map in the past. That's, I think he said 256 hours. Okay, I. So you can see where you actually should be going. That's nuts to me, Matt. Like, we we don't even. I think both of us combined don't even have 260 hours or whatever, which is crazy mm-hmm. to think about. Uh huh. The other one is uh the um upgraded sensor which lets you target things other than shrines so if you're looking for specific monsters and stuff you can use that man i'm trying to find milk i don't need like (laughs) i need to save that girl in k-town but i need that's a a tello you can get a tello okay okay um and i think the last one which i think is like one of the really nice quality of life upgrades is the um placeable teleports where you can make oh, your own wow. kind of Oh, wow. Okay. That, that's actually pretty good. Yeah. Damn, that. Yeah, I, I think those are all, like, really worth pushing for. Again, 60 hours in, and I don't have these valuable, <laughs> valuable tools. 
Matt, how 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 about you? How's your progress? Are you done the main story? Done all the temples or I haven't okay, I've done the four temples. Okay. And I I mean I kinda had fun with them. I honestly think like the Goron Temple might have been the most interesting one for me personally. Just cause uh Jared, that is a that is a minecart ass temple and I, I like me some. I like me cards. a good minecart too, Matt. Um I've also I I guess I because of Diablo I've been kind of taking a break from Zelda. For sure. I I want to kind of push the game to the point where I'm basically just before the Ganondorf fight, mm-hmm. but I don't really know where that happens because Jaren uh this is maybe spoilery as well. If you want to say it, like I don't mind. Okay. So, Jaren, this may be kind of spoilery as well, but I have this weird feeling that after I finish these four temples, I I thought that I could just go into Endgame now, but I, based on what I've experienced story-wise so far, I think maybe oh, I'm not that's weird. at the Endgame. I think potentially I'm at a 70-80% point. Matt, what is this game? But I'm not totally <laughs> sure. Sure, I'm not totally sure. There was something that happened. Okay, so the order that I did the temples was uh, like Re- Rito, Zora, Gerudo, and then okay. Goron. And doing that in that order, I I wanted to talk to like you and Rikush about this. I didn't know um, how far you guys have gotten. But something happened when I did them in that order. Something happened that really threw my perspective oh, of the game off. Okay, and... so again, okay, now this is where I'm tiptoeing on spoilers too. So I'm doing my plan was to do Rito, Zora, Goron, then Gerudo, but then you did Rito, Zora, Gerudo, Goron. Correct. Uh huh. Yes. Do you, Do you think I... the order? What What order do you think I should explore? I mean, I I would push for Goron just because I think it's like a fun dungeon. Yeah. Um, but I don't know, Jen, the way, the, the order that I decided to do really threw me off just because of, just because of like what, like kind of video game exp- except, um, expectations oh, okay. of like how plot is supposed to progress. Right. So thinking about the order I did threw me off. And I think that if you do it in a different order, it might make more, or if you do it like Goron first and then Gerudo first, you won't have the same kind of throw off that I had. Is this because... Again, like treading lightly here. Is this because like uh-huh. Gan Ganondorf's like originally from Gerudo? Is that kind of where you're coming from? No, okay. no, no. It's not. It's not. It has nothing to do with that. Okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Interesting, Matt. Interesting. Okay. So I, I think I'll try to mm-hmm. push. Uh, eventually, when we get to the update, I'll try to push. Um, after I finish the Water Temple, I'll go to Goron and then Gerudo as my last one, and then I, I think we can converse from there. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, Matt, I, I I feel like I need to say it. Matt, mm-hmm. you know, you know, we have one point one point two out now. You know, new new update, <laughs> Matt. Uh-huh. I'm still I'm still pushing every time it, I start the game, telling me there's a new update, and I just start my software, Matt. I just start my software because, Matt, the other day, I uh-huh. did the Master Sword glitch, which gets you, mm-hmm. you know, the unbreakable Master Sword from the tutorial into your game, and in cheesy Jaren fashion i'm trying to like get an in lore reason headcanon <laughs> why that ha- why i was able to make that happen for my link uh-huh. but at the same time not following these tutorials just to get that to happen was wild to me and i did it i did the point where you get the quote unquote the avatar master sword which lets you you know, glitch fuse a bunch of different Gleok horns to it so you can get all the elementals mm-hmm. at once. And Matt, mm-hmm. when mm-hmm. you get that to happen, your game bugs out in such a funny way to me where all your saves are affected by the fact that the Master Sword becomes, you know, superimposed in Link's hand, regardless of which save you load from your auto saves. Link will always have the Master Sword in his inventory and he'll also oh, have wild. it in his hand when you're hold when you're holding a bow he'll have his master sword out when you're riding a horse master sword out cinematic mm-hmm. master sword out and i thought that was the funniest <laughs> thing 
But uh, when you hard reset the game uh, and then start it back up, like not only does the glitch go away, but like your avatar weapon unfuses. So Matt, uh, I see. in my mm-hmm. inventory right now, I have a master sword with a silver lionel horn attached to it. So it has the 85 damage. I have mm-hmm. three master swords with each of the different elementals for the Gleok horns. And mm-hmm. then I have a master sword with a boulder attached to it so I can smash rocks with it. Nice. <laughs> and I don't know, Matt. Again, I refuse to update my game just because I like being able to do just because, mm-hmm. as I said last week or a week prior, I forgot last week we did the fast episode, is I'm experimenting a lot more with devices now where yeah. I'm trying to incorporate a lot more stabilizers just so I can make funky tanks or like funky attack like like aerial vehicles and I'm I feel like that has given me such um you know more play time than I would have otherwise done because as much as I hold Breath of the Wild in such high regards I feel that the ultra hand stuff the fusing stuff has impacted the game in such a way where I honestly, like, I, I think we talked about this before, Matt, but now that we have some hours under our belt, mm-hmm. do you think we can, like, go back from Ultra Hand? Or do you think, like, this has to be a staple moving forward in some way? I think in this series of games, I think something like Ultra Hand has to mm-hmm. be there. Um, in like, I guess the follow-up. It would be wild to not have it but i don't know like this series is already wild and from what i've heard like this is supposed to be like a trilogy of yeah. games and i i mean i guess if like the next game is basically just like everything's like tech everywhere yeah. they might be able to get around it in some way but uh i don't know do you the, do you think the alter hand is like wild i know they said that the legend of zelda is supposed to adapt the you know, open world aspect moving forward. But in regards mm-hmm. to Ultra Hand specifically, do you think this could be sp- spun off in a way? Like where the game actually, this is just the core component to like a spin off open world game that might not necessarily be Zelda adjacent, but like Ultra Hand exists. I don't know what they can do or what world they can set it mm. in, but I don't know. I feel like it's such a pivotal part of the game yeah. now, like a pivotal part of that identity that it needs to come back in some capacity, whether not sure if it's in the high rule or just something in general, but that's kind of how I'm mm-hmm. seeing it right now. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of like there as well. Like, I don't think it spins off. I think it's core. Okay. Moving forward. Yeah. It's, it's so good. Yeah. Man. It's or something so similar. good. Yeah. But yeah, Matt, mm-hmm. I know I told you this, that I have to tell you, but now that you have some shrines under your belt, Matt, what are your favorite shrines? Like, I know I asked you this like initially when we started talking about Zelda, but now that you have more done, do you have a particular set or any one specifically that you've enjoyed the most? There's um, two that stand out in my head mm. a lot. Uh, the first one is one of the kind of shrines where they take away your your gear. Yeah, the Proving Ground ones. Yeah, Proving Ground, that's what it's called. Yeah, the Proving Ground Shrine where it's all building or like um, Zonai devices. Have you done that one? There there are two. I'm not sure because honestly, those two have been my favorite, which are Proving Ground The Hunt, which is you playing with the the Roombas essentially. And Uh then Proving Ground Vehicles, which has you making vehicles. That was the one I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, the vehicle one was wild. Like, <laughs> Jared, I don't know if you did it, but basically after I found it the first time, it's you make a vehicle, you just drive to the right, take the, like, ascend yep. through that yep. thing, take the wing, yep. go into that center area and build this yes. wild-ass tank. Jared, I killed my, like, I wiped so many times yes. on that, and that's mostly because I kept blowing myself up. Exactly, where I feel like when I finally did solve it, quote-unquote, I had to take out the front cannons just so I would stop blowing myself off. Yeah, and then I, mm-hmm. I did the thing where I did a scorpion tail at one point, 
where I had like <laughs> the lightning and I, I, I stacked all the different elementals behind me with a mm-hmm. control head or whatever the device is called. Mm-hmm. And that mm-hmm. the the moment I drove out, it did a 180 <laughs> aimed at the enemy in front of me and then zapped me as collateral. Yeah. Amazing. Matt. Yeah, Amazing. That dungeon is so good. And I think the other one for me is what do you call it? I actually think the hunt actually is actually like really good as well. That was actually a very mm-hmm. fun shrine. But the the other one I was um initially thinking of was the kind of another proving round one, the darkness one. I don't know if you did that. I one. haven't done it. Okay, it's basically just up. Pr- What's the gimmick for that? Like one? a proving round, you only you start with basically your standard stick, standard spear type stick, and then a torch. And the room is just dark. It's just like you're like it's like you're oh. in the underground. I saw my partner do that one. That that one like yeah. nuts too. I think those are like two very memorable ones for me. Honestly, I I'm so glad they brought back the proving ground in some capacity mm-hmm. and like it's actually shrines now. Just because I remember the first time I went to the proving ground island in Breath of the Wild, I thought that was one of the best things in the whole game. Mm-hmm. Uh, as some again like. I love Proving Ground so much, and even like the DLC for Breath of the Wild 2, which was essentially that, where as someone who has exploited this game to hack and refuses to (laughs) Uh update his game, there's something humbling about finding a Proving Ground (laughs) shrine and playing the game like it was meant to be played in that album. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But again, I love this game, Matt. It's so good. And... I feel like moving forward with just how many games are coming out now uh, and Di- like the weekly Diablo check-ins, we-, we might not get to check in with Zelda as frequently. But w- when we do, man, we'll have uh, some story. I guess another check-in eventually would be the story discussion mm-hmm. uh, once we've both finished the game. Yeah, we push back and for that, something- oh, I guess. As well. yeah, yeah, definitely. Hope- and just in general, I, I want to bring in mark again at some mm-hmm. point to not only to talk about street fighter but his time with uh tears of the kingdom just because it is that elden ring experience as we said before where everyone has their own unique stories to it uh just seeing what everyone's up to what they've discovered uh is really fun as well and mm-hmm. i need to explore the depths a lot more because matt mm-hmm. i have a lot of treasure markings oh, that i need to need to find Same. I did recently finish the Colosseum uh, to get Majora's Mask and Matt. Oh, is that what's in the Colosseum? As, I haven't done that one. Yes. Oh, nice. As scary as Lionel's are, Matt, mm-hmm. all you need to do is spam puff uh, puff shrooms at them and they get confused and you just hit them in the back and they die. Oh, like, nice. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Thanks for the pro tip. Who needs, pro tip. To, fight, who needs to fight Lionel's the correct way when you can just... Uh, Equipped a uh, puff shroom, throw it at their feet. They get confused. <laughs> they put down their weapon, and you just spam. You can either mount them or just hit them in oh, the back. Jared, easy peasy. My my recent like Zonai tech that I've been trying to uh, work on is the yeah. um, is the <laughs> it's a kind of like missile that shoots into the air. It has a kind of what do you call it the detector head on it, and it has another missile yes. on it. And there's a bomb on the other end, so that it basically <laughs> flies into the air. It basically seeks a target and then it flies down and just drops that's a bomb so on them. Good, Matt. And that's so oh, good, man. That's so good. That was that's what I was gonna try to use to finish uh finish that uh Colosseum. But if I can just if I can just do it with puff shrooms, yo, that makes it a lot easier. Yes. Uh one last tip for the armored ones. It just equipped uh I, I believe it's the the Lionel I think Huff or like mm-hmm toenail or whatever it is mm-hmm. uh just hit a bunch to knock out their armor and then you spam your puff shrooms. nice 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 nice, nice, uh, nice. That, that that's what i got lost with with oh crap <laughs> this isn't working because i i can't damage an armor <laughs> uh things so i had to figure out that part but yeah man mm-hmm. uh i guess before we leave I, I really do hope the dlc for this game even if it isn't story related adds another proving ground you know champion's path or whatever it's called mm-hmm. But I just hope there's more devices and just more things to fuse in general. Just because I think I do, after having so much time with the game, I think I do agree with one of the initial sentiments I saw with Tears of the Kingdom, where it is, there's a lot of freedom towards Tears of the Kingdom, but it's like 
in a way, this kind of freedom illusion, just because there's only a finite amount of things you can fuse. There's only a finite amount of Zonai devices. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And even with the stuff you can fuse, they, they all have, you know, similar attributes to them where I do hope the DLC kind of gives us more devices and more things to fuse just because again Mm -hmm. like with what we have now you can use them in so many different ways that you know we're still discovering by the day but i would hope that they introduce more things to play with Uh to kind of further expand what the sandbox is but that Mm -hmm. beefy episode once again what are your final thoughts on this zelda check-in jared i am i'm looking forward to the dlc of the super underground (laughs) (sighs) <sighs> what a beefy game Matt what a beefy game and what another beefy episode Matt mm-hmm. want to thank you as always for joining me this week mm-hmm. I want to thank all our friends out there I want to thank <laughs> Diablo I want to thank Lilith I want to thank the Spider-Verse <laughs> oh, man. I want to thank Matt mm-hmm. I was in the Battle Hub I've made an AFK character whose name was straight up. Hey, I'm AFK farm me for free. I think it was like AFK free uh-huh. wins farms, Matt. <laughs> World chat did not take kindly to that. And I got really yeah. sad. <laughs> you can <bully> so <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe yeah. Matt, maybe, but Matt, I think I cut Jen, you off there. I, don't think the Elmo. Jen, I think the Elmo's about to make me spend $500. <laughs> Well, Matt, that might Uh be a mistake for another time, but until then, Matt, please take it away. This has been the mistake zone, and we're... Oh, no, Jared, I I didn't think of an ending. Jared, we're all out of AFK farms. (laughs) I'm just trying to give people free wins, Matt. I'm just trying to give people free wins. (laughs)